Well, well, thanks very much for coming to my session. Hopefully, I'm going to make it worth your while coming to listen to me today. Uh, my name's Tony Lowe. So I uh, run a small e-learning company, like very small. It's like it's myself and my wife, essentially. So we're very small, uh, called Webducate. And um, what I'm going to talk to you today is a, a kind of a passion of mine. It's a project which I've been doing, which I've um, been funded by the Talis Incubator for. And if it wasn't for the Talis Incubator, I wouldn't have done this work. So I'm extremely pleased that, that, that Talis and the board who were involved in that decided to give, us, give me this funding to do this work. Um, one of, one of the things I, I'm really interested in, and it's quite often I find it a hobby, because day to day I'm trying to make you know, a living, as, as we're all kind of aware of that. Uh, and as you know, a small company, I'm working mainly with uh, universities and uh, corporate trainers that you know, you're up against it just trying to deliver to deadlines. So this funding has been really good for me to, to take a bit of a break from that and to pursue something I've been, I'm particularly interested in. And so today I'm talking about a, a tool called Drawtivity, so something I'm really interested in is creating uh, e-learning authoring tools that can be used by non-geeks to uh, create what you might call you know, very small learning objects which involve interesting interactivity. Um, so one of my previous tools is about drag and drop. Uh, this tool is about drawing. So it's essentially it's an activity where you ask a student to draw on an image. And then, so it's like what kind of, so if you can do that and you can do that as a, as a teacher, what sort of opportunities does that offer to you? Uh, as a, you know, in, in education. So as I said, um, this is funded by the Talis Incubator. Um, they're a UK-based company. There's, a, there's a several members here. I can see two people, at least, in the audience from Talis. They're, they're, interest, they're involved in some very interesting products uh, around data management and recommendation systems, and I would uh, recommend that you find out more about them. And again, I'm very grateful that they are um, sufficiently... Uh, motivated by OER that they've offered this funding and allowed me to, to do this. Uh, and there's a, a link there. I don't know if, you, if you're particularly interested in, in following that up. So prior to, to running this company, I was uh, once upon a time, about 12 years ago or longer, I, I can't even remember now, I was a, a lecturer at university, University of Sheffield. And uh, at that time, that was when I first became interested in e-learning. And going on from that, I ended up being a learning technologist at Leeds University and I was there for about six years. And during my time there, I was very aware of people's desire to reuse uh, learning resources. And I guess during that time, I wasn't really aware of OER, certainly early on anyway. Um, but I was aware that there were barriers to reuse. And these are things which I am attempting to address in this project. And I, I kind of see, well, you know, personally, from my perspective, I, I see academics in, in uh, higher education institutions coming up against two main barriers when they think about reusing um, resources. First of all is that often resources come with no explicit licensing. Uh, and when you are involved uh, in staff development, uh, trying to help staff develop e-learning resources for the first time, the, the first enthusiasm is to go out and cut and paste things into their PowerPoints and then distribute those. And the first of all, you feel like a, a bad cop telling them you can't do that kind of thing. Uh, so it's, so it's, it's hard work to try and get past the fact that you kind of have to tell people you can't do that sort of thing and you know if you come across something useful you almost have to assume that you can't use it in the first instance. So first of all the first barrier is explicit licensing on, on learning content. And the second barrier I, I come across is about ad adaptation. So as a person involved in teaching, everyone's context in teaching is different. So if you take if you if you find a resource somewhere and you want to use it in your own teaching Nine times out of ten, you want to tweak it in some way. Sometimes you might want to tweak it quite a lot because your context is probably different from the person who's authored it. And generally, the, in the majority of cases, the person who's authored it hasn't authored it in a way thinking about it in a kind of context-free way. It's impossible to author e-learning content in a context-free way anyway. So, so adaptation is the, the second kind of barrier um, which I wanted to kind of start to address in this particular project. And so if, we, if, you, if you're creating content with what we might call rapid e-learning authoring tools, which is you know, an area which I kind of get involved with, uh, the sorts of files that are produced by these sorts of content authoring tools are extremely complex. And here are you know, like a, a, a view of some of the kind of, if you use Exe or Articulate Presenter or even some of the tools that I personally create, and you get the files, and then you, you, you might publish those in a repository and someone might find that resource and think, great, that's a really brilliant resource, but I'd love to tweak it. If they open up the files, and this is the sort of thing you'll see, and if, unless you're like a, a major geek, this is going to be 
extremely impossible, if not you know, very difficult, or if not impossible, to, to tweak these resources. But unless you can get hold of the source files, you have to go back to the original author to do that. They have to be extremely generous and all that kind of stuff. So it, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't generally happen. So again, this is, this is the, the main barrier I see about sort of adaptation. And this is a significant barrier to the, you know, the, this OER movement really, is how do we allow people to adapt resources so they can, textual, can contextualize them. I'm not trying to solve this problem for everybody. I'm just kind of, so what I'm doing in this project is focusing on one particular thing and demonstrating a methodology for that. So um, what are my aims? So I've, I've talked at the very beginning about this tool, Drawtivity. So as part of this project, I want to create a authoring system for creating this particular type of activity. And then built around that, I want that authoring system to be in a way which facilitates the adaptation. So once someone's created one of these activities, I want to lower the barriers to the min absolute minimum so that someone who comes across one of those activities can take it, adapt it, change the language, you know, change any aspect of it, and continue to share it. So those, those are my aims. How do I envisage this thing working? So this is a kind of like a, the, life, the cycle which I would hope that these resources would be able to go through as a result of this system. So here's a, your drawtivity activity, which you might discover anywhere on the web. So someone's produced this, and they've probably integrated it into some other content. And then they've published, they've used it in a course, they might have published it in a repository. I don't care where it is. So that activity's out there, and you discover it on the web somehow. Embodied in that activity is a unique link. And that unique link goes, takes that person to the authoring system where that activity was born. And it goes to the page, like the, the page that tells them the kind of the metadata, the surrounding information about that activity. Because that page is part of this web-based authoring system, you then have some options. You can download a copy of that activity and then immediately use it. So that would be this kind of path. You view the activity page, you download a copy, you can use that activity, and again, you might share it and other people might discover it. But obviously the more interesting path here is because this is a web-based authoring system, one click, you can create a copy of that activity in your own kind of authoring account. And once you've got that, then obviously it's, it's very simple to tweak a few settings or tweak it a lot. And you've then created an, an, an adapted form of that activity, which you then publish here, use, share, etc. So it potentially goes round and round a cycle. And you, you could have continuous improvement, or you could have, you know, there's all sorts of possibilities if that sort of model could work. So I'm going to try and do a demonstration now. Obviously, the internet's here is an absolute nightmare. So um, what I'm going to do is I have a, a sort of a, a server running on here, so I will attempt to demonstrate it uh, running on here. So there is actually a, a beta version of the system running um, about two thirds of the way through the project. So you can actually use that system and, and try this out. But I'm going to be demonstrating it running on my laptop. For, based on what I've seen everyone else struggling with. So I'm, I'm aware that I haven't got a, lot, a great deal of time. So this, this is an example activity. So the, the general idea is you can populate the center of the activity with any image you like. And then what you're asking the student to do, and you probably do that here in this text kind of introduction, um, in this particular case, I'm asking that student to outline the, the biceps muscle on here. So what, what, you know, from a pedagogical perspective, what I'm interested in there is that that's a different sort of question than asking somebody to, say, drag a label onto there and say, you know, where's the bicep? Or to show someone, um, you know, labels A, B, C, and D, already pointing at various parts and say, which is the bicep? You know, asking someone to draw the outline of the bicep on there is, I think, a richer, deeper task than just saying, where is it? Or is it A, B, C, or D? So I think, you know, I think there's... I think it's a useful thing, you know, this is the sort of thing I kind of get off on, I guess. You know, it's quite, I think it's quite interesting. So basically the tool, you know, it, it's, the, the student would click out the outline fairly quickly. You can, you know, reposition the points. Uh, you, it's, you can use a keyboard, so I can use the P key and then I can use the arrows. So, you know, it's, it's fairly accessible. Uh, you can quickly draw out the area. You can, you know, delete your last point, stuff, stuff like that. And then, and then feedback. You know, this is obviously where. So at, at the moment, what this is, what this, this this tool allows you to do is to give it the correct answer area, which you then reveal to the student. And part of that, obviously, part, sorry. In addition to that, you can then annotate that as well. So you can add these little icons 
and behind these icons, then you can start to add a little bit of text. So if there are particular aspects of that shape which are particularly important and you want the student to be aware of, then you can start to say things like that, and you can link out using, and you can turn those also into links. So this is just one example. Here's a, I used to be an engineer. Um, so you can do line or area-based activities. So here, you're being asked to, to draw a stress-strain curve uh, for mild steel. That might mean absolutely nothing to a lot of people in the room, but for an engineer, this is, you know, understanding that sort of, uh, the, the shape of that sort of curve is very important. So, again, you, you know, I'm expecting them to draw something along those sorts of lines. And here we can see it, it revealing the, the correct answer. And here, and here you can see there is optional animation and things like that, so you can actually have that line animate when it displays. And sometimes that's appropriate and sometimes it's not. So in this particular case, it is kind of appropriate because if you were to do a, an experiment, that's the, you know, that's the path that that experiment would, would pass through. So each, so, they, so sort of how do we make this so that this is an adaptable you know, resource? So when I also talked about you know, explicit licensing, so every one of these activities authored with this system also contains this button here, the OER button. And when you're clicking on that, it reveals this. And this is somewhere you can, you know, the author of that activity can populate some information about what is the licensing associated with that. Because this is TALIS funded and all about OER, the, the system, you know, it kind of falls straight jackets people into making all this content open. Like, so if you author using this version of this system, it's, you're going to have to make it open. But you can put some other information in there as well about that. And here's this unique link. So we click on that link. This takes you to, this is now, we're now looking at the authoring system. So this is the unique page associated with that activity. So you can see the activity here. You can, you know, you can, you can preview it. You can try it out. Uh, you can got, you got some text here. You can see what status. The status can either be complete or incomplete. So as the, as the person who's initially authored it finished it or not, you can see as soon as someone starts authoring an activity, it can be seen on the system. But if you visit an activity page, you can see whether they think it's finished. You can see how many people have downloaded it. And this, so this is the important thing, making copies of it. So you, um, you can download those particular sets of files. Eventually, there'll be a link here to download a SCORM version of it, that sort of thing. But this is obviously the interest, interesting link. So if you've got a, an authoring account on the system, which, again, is free, you know, you just set it up, put your details in the boxes, then you can click on this copy. When you do that... So this is now my authoring account on the system. You can see here I've now got a copy of it. And this, this is the, the, the authoring sort of system here. So if I wanted to change any aspect of that, so let's go into maybe the settings. These are all the settings associated with that. So if I wanted to change you know, the colors, I can do that here. If I wanted to change the text, so maybe I wanted to turn this into a French version of that activity, I just, I just changed the, the text there, etc. You know, the, the, the authoring of the feedback, again, it's a, you know, you can, start to, you can start to change it really quickly. And then I can publish it. And as, as soon as I've created this, it also has its own, you know, own activity page. So if someone then discovers that version of it, they, they, they can take that on themselves and take that somewhere else. So that, that I mean, I realise I'm probably talking about 100 miles an hour. Uh, but um, so that's basically what I've been working on, and I think it. I mean, obviously, because this is quite a, a, a specific example of creating a particular type of resource, mm -hmm. uh, and I control the whole thing. I can sort of set up the system and, and you know make that that journey that route possible. There are obviously opportunities for taking that kind of approach to a, a broader type of e-learning content, and obviously that would be very interesting to explore, because I think if we are going to get to the point where we aren't just sharing uh, you know, Word docs or open docs or open PowerPoints and then authoring those, if we're going to go beyond that and start sharing, reusing, and adapting more complicated interactions, we're going to need to have the sorts of tools which non-geeks can author, but not only non-geeks can author, non-geeks can use those tools to then take on other, other people's versions of activities and take them on and contextualise them. Uh, so that... So you can see uh, a live version of this kind of beta 
of the system at uh, drawtivity.org. So I'd, you know, I encourage you to go there and have a play, have an explore, and please, I mean, in terms of my timeline, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of complete the official milestones of the project uh, sometime sort of early next year. So there's plenty of time for, for me to get feedback and to make real changes to the system. So I'm completely open to people's ideas uh, about, you know, how this could be improved. Ultimately, I intend to make you know, everything open. So the, the, the authoring system, the, I mean, it's delivering through Flash, so the Flash source files, the whole lot will be made available. So you'll be able to install it wherever you want and, you know, and, and adapt it to whatever your own particular circumstances are. Um, yeah, so hopefully that was uh, interesting and uh, I think we've got time for questions. Thank you, Tony, for being so... Yeah. <laughs> to be very, very at one time. Even well, I'll do my best. A little, a little bit. <laughs> and that's because we have more time if anyone has some questions about the charity project or... I'm just wondering, uh, you mentioned that uh, you're looking into kind of other types of exercises people might be able to do or that are similar to yours. I'm just wondering, it, it, it looks really great, and right? it would be great to, to expand to, to different kind of activities. In the sense, for example, let's say multiple Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's like QTI standards and things like for multiple choice questions, but you could certainly build an authoring system around a standard like QTI that would facilitate this process in a similar sort of way. But, you know, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it was great to get this, this pot of money from Talis, and it allowed me to build a tool that I've always wanted to build anyway and to build this authoring system around it. It's just the, the, con the prospect of taking that that into a much bigger kind of environment is very exciting, but also it's not something I personally can take on on my own. But, you know, if there's people out there that think this is a, a good approach, uh, you can go away and do it on your own, or you can come and talk to me and we'll do it together or whatever, you know. Yeah. Well, I know. Yeah, yeah. This is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I started this, pro I mean, I've been d doing Flash for a while, and it, you know, an HTML5, you think, well, it, unfortunately, I could build it in HTML5, but no one would, would be able, you know, very few people would be ready to receive it, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather it was a useful tool right now, but, yeah. if, you know, yeah. we'll worry about that later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.